Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Operations Flexibility and Emissions Control. I'm Mary Caldwells. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager at GE Power Digital. And before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping and announcements. You know, this webinar is being recorded, which is great because it will be available on demand for about a year. So feel free, feel free to share it with all of your colleagues. Today's event will be interactive, so I want to encourage you to ask questions, um, which will mean you'll probably need to disable your pop-up blockers because they may interfere with certain aspects of our web conference. Um, for an enhanced view of our presentation, be sure to click the Enlarge Slides button. It's located on the gray bar above the slide window. We have some content that you can download, including a PDF of this presentation. Just click on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your console. And you may ask a question at any time. So submit yours. Just click on the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of the screen and type it into the question box. And then hit Submit. And uh, we're going to be answering questions verbally at the end of the webcast. So now I'd like to introduce our, today's speakers and cover off on our agenda. Um, with us today is Amy Francetic, who is a high technology executive and entrepreneur, entrepreneur with over 20 years of management experience, spanning startup companies, private equity, research, and Fortune 500 companies. She currently serves as Senior Vice President of New Ventures and Corporate Affairs at Invenergy. And previously, she served as CEO of Clean Energy Trust, a nonprofit organization in Chicago whose mission it was or is to accelerate the development of clean energy technologies and businesses in the greater Midwest. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Political Science from Stanford University. With her is Richard Biederman. He is the Vice President of Operations and Asset Management at Invenergy. And Rich will be available uh, throughout the webcast to answer questions for us at the end of the webcast as well. He is responsible for managing Invenergy's portfolio of thermal and solar generation projects. He has two decades of experience in operations and asset management, along with project management and technology commercialization in the, in the in energy industry. Prior to joining Invenergy, he held various roles uh, with BP and the Institute of Gas Technology, and he's published more than 25 professional journal articles and research reports on a variety of topics. He has successfully developed software applications for the energy industry, so he's definitely going to have an opinion about what digital means to, uh, to operations and asset management. And he holds a Bachelor of Science degree from DePaul University and an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And our final speaker is Jonathan Nyson, who is Solution Manager for Outcome as a Service at GE Power Digital. He has over 20 years of experience in the management, operation, and maintenance of combined cycle power plants, working primarily at customer sites before joining GE in 2006 as a plant manager in our PGS O&M business. He began his career in the power industry as a maintenance technician and environmental health and safety specialist, he moved up to instrumentation and control work, operations, and then to plant and regional management. And for the last six years, he's been a subject matter, subject matter expert in advisory roles for our customers uh, on our digital solutions and has um, supported GE's ongoing digital transformation as an industrial internet power generator leader and advisor. Jonathan holds a BS degree in business management from Herzing University and is a veteran of the U.S. Navy. So now I'd like to, um, as we uh, get ready for our speakers to begin, I just want to ask a quick poll question of the audience. And I'm curious about what you're responsible for in your organization. Uh, are you responsible for power generation in central operations? Or are you uh, responsible for power generation at a fossil plant? Or power generation from one of the uh, new renewables that have now come online, like wind or wind farms or solar farms? Are you responsible for emissions compliance, or are you responsible for transmission and distribution? So take a moment and answer the, the poll, and we're really curious to see what our audience mix looks like today, and really appreciate you taking the time to fill this out. So let's see if we've had a chance for everyone to uh, click on one of the radio buttons. 
Well, it looks like about 36, almost 37% of our audience is responsible for power generation at a fossil plant. Um, we have a nice mix of folks that are from central operations and from renewables, as well as some folks from uh, em emissions compliance and transmission and distribution. So, Amy, you've got a nice mix of um, folks on the phone uh, and on the webcast listening to you, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Mary, um, and thank you so much to GE for having Rich and I here today. We're very excited to talk a little bit about Invenergy and how we're using digital technology to improve our operations. And uh, we're very proud to be a long-term partner with uh, General Electric um, and um, to be, in many cases, an early adopter a lot of a lot of your equipment and, um, and your digital technology. So thank you so much for having us. I thought I would just start with a, um, a little bit of background on Invenergy. Um, we are headquartered in Chicago. Um, we're a 15-year-old business. Uh, run by Michael Polsky, who is a uh, more than 30-year veteran of the power industries. And um, we have about almost 800 people that we employ worldwide, uh, about 350 people in Chicago and 450 um, in the field or in remote locations. And w our business is primarily in the United States, but we also have a footprint in Europe Mexico, Latin America, Japan, and Canada, and are very excited about uh, Latin America in particular. Um, we um, actually have over 14 gigawatts of energy uh, in production or construction, and we are known um, probably in the industry most for our wind production, but um, as you can see on this slide, we have built and own and operate, in most cases, wind, solar, uh, natural gas thermal and battery storage, with battery being you know uh, the newest technology that we've been bringing online. And Rich is in charge of managing um, our solar and our natural gas thermal assets. And we've been using digital technology across the fleet uh, because we have a 24/7 control center here in Chicago that we use to remotely monitor and control our uh, worldwide assets. So it's really important to us to make sure that we stay abreast of innovation in the digital sector um, to help us do our job better, and most importantly, to get better performance out of our generating assets across the fleet. One of the trends that has been driving the opportunity in digital technology has been the dramatic cost reductions in renewables. And when uh, Michael Polsky started Invenergy 15 years ago, um, renewables were uh, starting to happen, but were really dependent upon subsidization in order to, um, to find a market. And as you can see from this graph, which shows the unsubsidized cost of energy of um, renewables, natural gas, and coal, uh, the renewables unsubsidized are starting very quickly to, um, they're actually crossing over on coal and starting to approach natural gas. And we expect by the year 2020 that they will be on par with natural gas. Um, and there is a lot of innovation happening in the renewable industry to decrease the cost of production of wind and solar. But one of the big opportunities that we see to accelerate that is, in, with, is with digital technologies. On this next slide, I wanted to show how much renewable energy is being brought online um, compared to fossil fuels. And so it, it does create an opportunity to um, install new technologies but it also does also create a, a strain on the grid. And so as you look at these intermittent resources, there are vulnerabilities um, on the grid that um, are a result of um, wind and solar. And so we're looking at ways to uh, make sure that we can address those vulnerabilities, improve the uh, reliability of the grid. And you know the grid infrastructure is relatively old. It needs a dramatic um, improvement and, and upgrade. And uh, renewables is sort of forcing that issue uh, right now um, in the industry. And you can see here on this grid as well that about renewable energy makes up um, about almost 14% of our capacity um, here in the United States and is growing pretty dramatically. And we see storage as a really important enabler of adding additional renewable energy onto the grid. Um, but we, we try in our business to cite projects and choose technologies based upon what is needed in the location where the, you know, the assets themselves are strongest 
and um, and what kind of customer de customer demand will facilitate that choice? The the digital technology um, layer that we like to call the application layer of energy um, is is something that's really emerging just in the last few years because of the um, the downward cost curve of renewables. And that application layer is the hardware and the software that re resides on top of the infrastructure to improve the re reliability, affordability, and security of those assets. And as I said, we, we install digital technology at our central control center as well as at the, um, the generating assets themselves. And maybe I'll pause here for Rich if he wants to say anything um, in particular about how we're using digital technology in solar or natural gas. Yeah, thanks, Amy. I think Invenergy is very interested in being proactive about adopting uh, digital and computing technologies that will improve our ability to uh, enhance efficiency and availability in our operating fleet. Um, so we are we're extremely attuned to opportunities to do all of those things. And in our fleet today, we are embracing and adopting uh, some of the technologies um, that you're that you're hearing about in this presentation. Great, thanks, Rich. Um, one of the the commitments that we have to digital technology is the creation of a fund to invest in. Some of these technologies, especially ones from high growth companies, um, and, and to also be an early adopter and pilot tester of those technologies. So I'm in charge of making investments in, um, in this space, and I wanted to show you sort of the five verticals that help inform our investment thesis. These are the five areas um, in which we seek innovation that we can fund and also use at, um, at Invenergy and also that we frankly think is important across the industry. And we came up with these five verticals by talking with uh, the engineers and operators here at Invenergy, people like Rich, folks in our control center, um, people that manage our wind assets to understand where the pain points were in their jobs. And then we looked outside into the industry to see where technology could solve some of those problems. And um, this is, you know, part of this application layer is enabled by low-cost sensors, as well as you know, capabilities and algorithms in software to analyze all the data that is currently being produced and generated by equipment and, and other kinds of infrastructure. And this is a phenomena that has occurred very recently and has uh, allowed for innovators to come up with solutions for some of these problems and is a, is a trend that we think is um, very, very timely and is in need of investment in order to accelerate uh, the, um, the efficiency of our entire fleet as well as the adoption of more renewables. So first, we look at new power generation, and that could be componentry or completely new form factors for generating energy. Um, next, we're very excited about storage. As I said, we have five projects um, in construction or operation now. All of the battery projects are running in the PJM market. We've just won a sixth. Uh, project and we're, we're using different forms of lithium in all of those battery projects. Uh, we are not so interested in, in funding new types of chemistries because of the cost um, requirements of that, but we're very interested in battery control systems, the integration of battery systems, and how they might um, serve not just the grid, but also the electrified transportation industry. Next, we're very excited about distributed energy resources. Um, Invenergy, you know, builds utility scale uh, energy projects, and we are very aware of the opportunity that is emerging for microgrids, um, you know, for folks to operate independent of the grid or to have some resiliency apart from or in addition to their uh, connection to the grid. And we're also very aware of how um, how popular rooftop solar and smaller scale wind and solar is becoming, um, as well as you know, building scale improvements in equipment and technologies, you know, HVAC, windows, lighting controls, um, and then on top of that, the management systems that will allow utilities and developers like ourselves to manage these disparate and diverse types of assets. So that's a very, very large opportunity for investment, um, and we're seeing a lot of great innovation in that vertical. And then next, um, you know, a big part of this application layer and digital solution is in data analytics and cybersecurity. So we are using a number of different solutions um, to help predict failures in our equipment, to help us understand when to schedule maintenance, when to order parts, 
Um, and then also how to monitor any potential um, vulnerabilities or intrusions in the network itself. So as you bring more and more assets onto the grid, um, it does create more vulnerabilities. And um, as I mentioned, the grid technology itself is rather um, outdated and needs to be made more secure. So there we see a very big opportunity uh, for, for companies that are creating cybersecurity solutions to help the energy industry operate more um, reliably and more securely. And then lastly, we're always looking for solutions to take cost out of our operations. Anything that will help us save money, you know, help us make decisions faster, um, and help us, you know, reduce, um, re the reduce the cost of running our operations is very, very important. And it's in that area that um, Invenergy has made its first investment. Um, we invested in a company called Aqualon Energy Services, and they create a software solution that helps energy um, traders, traders of electricity, to automatically settle uh, power trades. And we were surprised to learn last year when we were looking at this company that even though many of the trades are conducted uh, electronically, um, the settlement of the trades happen through fax and email. So Aqualon has created a, a solution to do that more automatically and settle the matching trades very, very quickly, and then to allow the, um, the, the human capital to focus on the discrepancies. And this is important because it allows you to manage your trading desk more efficiently, but most importantly, it helps reduce the amount of capital that a trader has to carry on their balance sheet to cover the open trades. So that's a little bit, um, before I hand off um, back to, to you all, Mary and John, I just want to see if Rich had any comments across this. And, and Rich says no. He says carry on. He's ready, He's ready to answer any questions that might arise. And, um, and thank you so much for letting us uh, share a little bit about our experience using digital technologies in our operations. Thank you. Uh, and Amy, I really appreciate that. Um, we have one more poll question. Um, we would love to know uh, where you, the audience members, are looking to innovate or invest within your organization. Are you looking to improve operational flexibility and efficiency for your existing assets? Are you adding new power generation or energy storage? Are you improving distributed energy resources? Or are you looking at better data analytics for short and long-term decisions? And while we give people a chance to um, respond to this poll question, I also want to encourage you, once again, that if you have any questions that you'd like us to ask, either Amy or Rich at the uh, end of the webcast, just go to your Q&A button in the uh, bottom of the screen and uh, submit your question, and we'll be sure to get to it. We've already had a few come in, so thank you very much for that. I also wanted to just acknowledge, um, Amy, one of the interesting things uh, I found about what you presented is that you're looking at ways of, of evolving your generation mix and, and having more operational flexibility from a lot of different angles. Um, and I think that that's really uh, compelling and, and useful to our audience. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank All right, you. so let's see thank what, you. you're welcome. Let's see what everyone said. So it <clears> looks like a majority of the audience members are looking to improve operational efficiency and flexibility for their existing assets, about 54%. And then almost 30% are looking for better data analytics and short and long-term decisions. So I think we can definitely help you uh, on both fronts. And so it is with uh, great pleasure that I now transition over to Jonathan Nyson from our GE Power digital team. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Amy and Rich, for a, a wonderful presentation about Inv Energy and their focus. And thank you for everybody for joining today. Like Mary said, my name is Jonathan Nyson. I work in the GE Power Digital business as a solutions manager, providing outcome as a service solutions for our customers. Um, today, I'd like to talk a little bit about digitalization and the use of that in the changing market, and, and kind of build on some of the points that that Amy touched on in, in her portion of the presentation. So there are many factors affecting the power industry today, uh, low load growth, market dynamics. Organizations and customers who previously only consumed electricity are rapidly becoming generators. In 2014 alone, dis distributed energy resources accounted for a generating capability of about 136 gigawatts. 
Within 10 years, we expect that that will grow fourfold to about 531 gigawatts. Intelligent consumption is having a huge impact on demand response. And we're forced to answer questions about how do we address the, the, great, the need for greater efficiency and ensure that we're helping our customers stay compliant with emissions guidelines and regulations, things that are coming out uh, regarding the emissions like COP21. And what does it all mean for the energy industry? And GE looked at this. And in 2014, we began building the digital business that we're going to talk about today. And when GE Power, as a business, looks at digital, we considered the digital business a solution to solve for the changes and challenges facing our industry. Some of them are problems, but some of them present some interesting opportunities. And so the first step to taking on these changes and helping our customers is to reconsider how we looked at what we call the electricity value network. So the digital age is transformed. Oops, sorry, I went back a slide. I clicked on it on accident, Jonathan. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I apologize. All right. That's okay. So the digital age is transforming the power industry. With digital, we can create, combine, and connect the entire electricity value network, which includes all of the different components of the power industry, generation, marketing and operational trading, transmission, distribution, distributed energy, and, and behind the meter. So imagine a future that fosters economic growth through access to clean, reliable, sustainable and secure electricity. The electricity value network is being transformed by digital technologies augmented to support the flow of power and information in all directions, where all actors contribute to the overall efficiency, cost effectiveness, resilience, and sustainability of the system. The World Economic Forum estimates that there's about $1.3 trillion of value that can be unleashed purely by deploying and adopting digital technologies over the next 10 years in the electricity industry. If we look out to 2060, we believe that number is at least $10 trillion of value that can be unleashed by deploying and adopting digital technologies. So we have a tremendous opportunity here to shape that future together. But it's no secret, power production today is a constantly changing game. There's variability in fuel prices and sources. Renewables are changing production loads for traditional power generation in the gas and coal fleets, making it even harder to produce energy at variable loads without impacting emissions or driving up production costs. Tighter regulations and future regulation unknowns add to the uncertainty for investment and where to meet requirements. There is a need to adapt to this uncertainty and this change and adapt fast, but how? So there are several ways. Increasing capacity and flexibility in traditional gas and coal facilities, enabling them to take advantage of market opportunities when renewables are unable to meet the demand or unable to expand into ancillary markets. Managing emissions at facilities to, to be compliant with tight and changing regulations and driving revenue between outages, maximizing availability and reliability, extending outage intervals and shortening outage durations. In short, the best way to adapt is having the right information at your fingertips to make better informed decisions about how to adapt and which direction to go. The challenges affect all levels of an organization. Uh, executives want to align their daily operations with their initiatives and their strategy and answer important questions like, is my portfolio meeting my business needs? And where do I invest? How do I get the most return on my investment across all of my asset types? Asset managers want to prioritize investments and look across their, op their portfolio for opportunities. And they're asking questions like, how are my plants running across the fleet? And how should my investment money be prioritized? 
which plant should I put that money in and, and which project should I invest in to improve outcomes. And they, they need to be able to understand and see information to communicate effectively with traders and others in their organization in order to be able to maximize revenue and minimize risk at their facilities. Plant managers focus on meeting the daily operations of their facility while balancing system risk and staying within their budget. And they're asking questions like, how are operations contributing to risk? Is there something that I'm doing in my facility that's making it worse rather than making it better? Is my plant achieving its operating targets? And if it's not, why? And what actions can I, can I take now to improve what I'm doing, to minimize risk, to meet those operating targets? And what actions can I take in the future? Do I have the right information at all of these levels to make the right decisions? And so customers are looking for answers. They're looking for initiatives, and they want to drive these with a consistent way of viewing their operations with a common set of key performance ind indicators. And we've gone out over the last seven or eight years, and we've talked to hundreds of our customers about what's important to them, what outcomes they want to achieve, and what key performance indicators are important to them. And we've built our suite of applications around what our customers are asking for. So as people focus on answering the questions that we were just talking about, they will typically start to think about what information they need to get the answers and what outcomes they need to achieve their goals. In my experience from the past as a plant manager and asset manager, this, this information came, had to come from a variety of sources. And it didn't always provide the necessary information to make the right decisions to achieve the outcome that I wanted. For example, as you know, there are usually trade-offs associated with improving an outcome. It's necessary to understand what those trade-offs are and understand the full effect of trying to achieve a diet desired outcome in order to avoid causing problems in another. The GE solution to providing KPI visibility is a digital solution called operations optimization, and it's a cloud-based suite of applications that is focused on the KPIs that our customers told us were important to them, and it's focused on providing the necessary information that each level of an organization told us they needed to make effective decisions. It's intended to be a single source of truth, you know, built on the credible data that's supplied from the customer facilities and run through analytics and physics-based models to provide the information necessary to make informed decisions. And it's a holistic approach. So if a customer comes and says, we want to improve efficiency, the, the system is built to understand what the trade-offs are and to find that sweet spot where they're meeting their outcome, they're meeting their objective, and they're avoiding the trade-offs or minimizing the trade-offs in other areas. And it's, it's a Goldilocks zone. It's not too much and it's not too little. They're achieving what they wanted to do, and they're not putting in or adding any more risk into their portfolio. So what have we done so far to make this digital transformation real? GE built an operating system called Predix, and it is designed for the industrial internet. It combines a best-of-breed technologies for massive data ingestion, and if you think about the amount of data that flows from a, a typical power facility, then the number of sensors that are in a, in a power-generating asset, to, to gather all of that information and ingest it and run it through an analytic model and execute that model and build libraries to determine how things operate. That's, it's a massive undertaking, and Predix was the operating system that GE has built to, in order to be able to withstand that on the industrial Internet. Built on that platform is what we call a digital twin, which is an organized collection of physics-based models and, and advanced analytics that uses a model that the present state of a of physical asset of an actual power plant provides to create a virtual model of that asset for comparison and optimization. So imagine a power plant, a digital twin of that power plant is a model based on actual information, but it uses optimizers in, to, to be able to determine the best 
scenario for how to run that plant in any configuration. And so the, the user can compare and do what-if analysis and, and determine which is the best way to operate or toward the outcome that they're trying to achieve while minimizing risk. And on top of that, we've built applications like the operate, operations optimization pro application that I just talked about to be delivered on the Predix platform and to be inclusive of all the plant and fuel types and other segments of the electricity val value network that you see on the bottom. So fossil, nuclear, renewables, transmission, distribution, and prosumers, which is producer consumers. All of those are included and nothing's excluded and it's, entire to be, it's, it's intended to be agnostic of fuel type, manufacturer, equipment type. And there are currently around 20,000 developers across GE, our partners and customers using this Predix platform to build software and applications for the industrial internet. So this is GE Power's current suite of digital applications. Uh, that, that is built on the Predix platform, like I, like I mentioned. We offer a complete set of applications designed to, to improve asset performance and reliability, to increase operational efficiency, and to give power business leaders insights that allow them to make more profitable decisions. All of the applications are built on the Predix platform. And operations optimization, which we just were speaking about, is a suite of applications. You can see the middle layer there, which provides enterprise visibility across the power plant, across a fleet, providing a holistic understanding of operational decisions that can improve, improve efficiency, flexibility, reduce emissions, expand capacity and lower production costs while providing actions that can be taken to make improvements and focus on an improved outcome. So how does it work? A little bit of the nuts and bolts. Uh, the, I'll take a quick look at how the information flows from the sensors into the uh, in the plant to the cloud and back. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of sensors in a typical power plant. And they're, they're on the equipment throughout a plant, then they feed information to the control system in real time to make changes necessary to keep the equipment operating within design limits and to respond to changes such as load requirements, steam requirements, fuel requirements, necessary to keep the plant operating within those design limits. The control system responds to those sensors by changing set points in the facility or flagging a set point that needs to be changed for an operator to intervene to make the desired change happen. So the, the GE suite of applications work in conjunction with the sensors and the, and the plant DCS in two ways. The first is a supervisory role where the application resides on an edge or an on-premise device where there's actually a box located at the site to supervise the changes that the DCS is making to help optimize operations and possibly recommend changes that could be made to reach the desired outcome. In addition, there's an advisory layer that resides in the cloud, which takes information provided by the sensors, DCS, and edge devices to provide visibility and insight to the user for trending and analysis across the key performance indicators and it also provides recommended actions back to the edge device, which then makes a determine of whether or not that gets fed back to the controller. And it also helps the user determine what potential action they could to take to improve the key KPIs in the future outside of an automated system, like improving operating procedures or those types of things. So I want to take a, a really quick look at a few examples where we've worked with our customers using digital to achieve an outcome. Um, A2A is one of our customers, and, and in Italy, they, they continue to expand the, the use of renewals, renewables into the mix of power generation. And it, it ended up leaving fossil plants like A2A's Chivasso plant facing closure, and it actually did close. It was mothballed in 2014 for, and for two years. While other fossil plants in A2H fleet were being dispatched because they were more efficient at variable loads. So we ended up working with A2A to update the plant with digital solutions to baseline their performance, identify opportunities to improve, and then add other upgrades within GE's portfolio, you know, like our Fleet 360 initiative, which looks holistically at parts and services and, and optimized controls that help the plant become more flexible, ramp faster, run more efficiently at lower loads, and operate within their emissions thresholds. 
Our digital solutions continue to monitor their performance, predict areas of improvement, and enable the plant staff to be in the best shape for dispatch in their new economic model. And so now in 2016, the plant opened for business again, and it's back in the money, and it ended up winning a top plant award from Power Magazine in 2016. A second customer that uh, example is uh, NRG and at their Hunter Town facility in Pennsylvania, an 840 megawatt combined cycle gas turbine plant. was focused on operating the plant to maintain high availability, but they knew they were leaving money on the table. And the plant had to shift from running base load to cycling more often, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We worked with their team to open up more operating modes within the plant, allowing them to bank hours on the gas turbine while running at lower loads to offset stress from periods running at maximum loads so they can could conserve life on their parts while keeping an eye on their outage schedule. And today they've seen up to a 3% improvement in megawatt output, have gained an additional $5 million in incremental revenue in their competitive energy market with no impact to their outage schedule. A third example uh, is at Owensboro Municipal Utilities Elmer Smith plant. They have relied, they have relied on uh, an outcome optimizing control from GE to optimize their boiler performance for many years. They were an early adopter. The efficiency is extremely important to them, but they were also concerned about emissions too. So balancing the need to improve their heat rate while lowering their NOx became easier when they implemented the boiler optimization, which is one of our offerings. An additional benefit is they have seen improved reliability and reduced boiler tube leaks by focusing on the areas of the boiler that need soot cleaning using digital solutions to tell them when and where to clean. And the last example is with the GE partner Exelon here in the United States. They've really embraced the digital transformation and they see Predix as a great platform to unify their innovation efforts across their mixed generation fleet. Specifically, they've refined their wind forecasting ability so they can bid the renewable energy into the market with better economic results and use that information to predict operations for the rest of their fleet. So GE is really looking beyond packaged solutions. Yes, we have a suite of products, but we're focusing on the outcomes that we can deliver, as you can see here. Reducing startup fuel, increasing output and capacity, lowering heat rate. This is a real differentiator for the industry because we aren't coming into an industrial environment and trying to sell software packages. We're building apps on the digital twin technology to change outcomes. And all of it together, the apps, our deep domain knowledge and approach to a platform built for the industrial internet gives GE a unique advantage. Because we understand the machines and we're running the right analytics and can have a different conversation now with our customers, we're sitting down with them and having the conversation about real tangible outcomes we can deliver by harnessing the power of data. Reducing startup fuel by 10%, increasing output by 1%. Capacity increased by 3 to 4%, lowering heat rate and emissions. These are all important things to our customers and outcomes that they're looking for. If we can put a bottom line number to that, to what we're selling, and we will underwrite that for our customers, it's, it's hard to argue that we're, we're focused on delivering real tangible outcomes for our customers. So, what can you do to learn more and what's next? Um, there is a link in the, the, the uh, presentation that we're giving today that allows you to take the flex tour. And it, it's, it's the ability to look at how you can opti optimize operations in, in the new dynamic market that we've been talking about and learn a little bit more of the, the very quick examples that I gave to you uh, regarding some of the customers that we're working with and, and how they've been able to use the digital technology to improve their operations and achieve an outcome. There's also information out there, white papers available about how these products work in depth and how we're, we're really leaning in to change the face of the industry. To, to provide outcomes to our customers that they're looking for in order to help them achieve, achieve their goals and objectives. 
And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today and turn it back over to Mary. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jonathan and, and Amy and Rich. Uh, we're going to now move into our Q&A portion of the webinar. And again, I just want to encourage anybody who has a question to just uh, enter your question in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. The first question is, a, is for Rich. Rich, um, there's some curiosity about how adding digital solutions may impact your staffing. Um, is there a worry about you know, dig digital displacing staff? Yeah, good question. The way that we think about that is we have some very, very talented um, engineering and technical expertise here in Invenergy, and we aren't thinking about reducing um, that expertise in any way. We're thinking about how do we better leverage that? How do we provide additional capabilities through computing power, through algorithms, and through digital technologies that will extend what we do? Um, you know, there's a mountain of data available, as, as Jonathan mentioned huge amount of data available flowing from our control system, our PI system, vibration monitoring. And, you know, how do we take all of that data, make sense out of it, and make um, impactful business decisions using that data? That, that's really what we're focused on. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Rich. And the next question, actually there's two questions for you, Amy. One uh, would like to just have a reminder of the uh, the company that you've invested in that, that does um, settlements. And then the second part of the question is, how do you evaluate new technology for your organization? Sure, sure. The company is called Aqualon Energy Services, A-Q-U-I-L-O-N. Um, their website is aqualonenergyinc.com. Uh, and it's in the suburbs of Chicago, and it's run by CEO uh, Jeff Wagner. Um, and then in terms of evaluating technologies, you know, we, it's, it's interesting. We source uh, potential investments from um, a real variety of sources. You know, some come through directly to our fund team through our relationships. Some come through Invenergy and the folks here at Invenergy, um, just, you know, from people that they know in the business or that they meet along, their, along the way. Um, sometimes they're referred by other investors in the space, and we are just um, starting to, to you know, get this ramped up, and so people are just beginning to get to know us. And when we do find an investment, um, we, we first, of course, measure it against those five verticals because we are trying to be very focused. And then um, secondly, we are interested in companies that are at the um, what's called in the venture world the B and C stage of investment, meaning that they've had some level of investment already to help prove that the technology works, to help hire more of a complete team, and they and most um, companies at the B and C stage have some revenues, so they're not profitable uh, most likely, but they are um, they are earning some kind of revenue. They have some customers, and there's usually a strong you know CEO in place. So if a company comes to us and they're either too early, uh, maybe they're you know just getting started and they need some seed capital, then that's very easy for us to say this is you know we, we might want to take a look at it just to watch it, but we'll put it kind of on our watch list and we'll we'll pass very quickly so we don't waste their time. Um, and then if it's a very late stage company where they already have a lot of customer traction and they're looking for more sort of growth or mezzanine investment, that's usually um, that's usually not a fit for us as well. So. Um, but if it is in one of those five buckets, again, we'll look at it still, and maybe there's a, you know, there might be um, some way for that company to do business with Invenergy. So if we think that the, it's a good fit with Invenergy, we might refer them and introduce them into Invenergy. But if they fit in the stage of investment and then in the five verticals, we really start digging into the technology. We look at competing solutions. Um, we talk to our uh, colleagues here at Invenergy to understand what they think about it technically, operationally. And then very, very quickly, you know, if we feel satisfied with um, the technical efficacy of the solution, then we very quickly dig into the economics and how viable the business is. You know, so do they have a decent business model? Do they have um, a real path to revenue and growth? Um, is it a real, you know, financial benefit to the customer? Um, and then we, of course, start to do diligence on the whole team itself to see that this is a solid team. Um, so that's just a few of the the ways we start to evaluate the companies, we oftentimes start with a phone call and then we go do a site visit. It's very important to meet with these businesses if we're serious. Um, and it takes, you know, it takes several months to get all the way through the diligence phase before we would make an investment. Yeah, I could see that. And Rich, 
from your perspective, when you're evaluating that new technology for for your operations fleet, um, do you have a, a, a similar kind of process for evaluating? Uh, perhaps a bit less formal, but uh, we, we are very focused on a couple of major themes, um, specifically uh, impact on availability and uh, impact on efficiency. And if we can demonstrate uh, a technology's ability to improve our availability or improve our efficiency as measured by increased output or uh, you know, decreased fuel input, um, those are things we are always very interested in evaluating. Wonderful. All right, our next question comes in for Jonathan. Uh, the question is, do you envision uh, with the future of Predix that it might replace historians such as Pi, or does it work in conjunction with data historians? Well, right now it works in conjunction with data historians, and we ingest the data from the, the data historian and, and into the Predix application and platform and then into the separate applications to, to feed models and analytics to, to provide an outcome on a user interface. Um, there is the potential to, you know, for Predix to, to replace data historians and, and potentially Pi in the future, but uh, it's, it's not on the near-term radar for to do that. Yeah, and a similar kind of question uh, asks about how the system would, would differ from, you know, existing DCSs or is it augmenting a DCS that may already be, uh, have the ability to tune some of the systems for efficiency and automation. Do you see it as redundant or an augmentation to a DCS? Oh, it's absolutely an augmentation. Uh, you know, we don't have any intention at this point of, of trying to replace DCSs across the world's fleet of, of power generating stations. So typically what I've seen in the past is that DCSs are programmed to perform, perform a certain function within a, a design limit criteria, and there's all kinds of risk abating controls put in there and, and plenty of cushion. And what we're doing with the applications that, that we're building uh, is we're finding areas where we can push those limits to, to achieve an outcome for a customer and working, but still working within design limits, obviously. And using our software and digital applications as an augmentation to the DCS to give the operators and owners of these pieces of equipment more information and about how to push those limits safely and within compliance. So it is, it's definitely definitely an augmentation to a DCS at this point. Thank you so much. All right, so the next question is a, a curiosity about the role that regulations play in assisting either renewables or aid in fossil fuel regeneration across the, the fleet. Uh, Amy or Rich, do you have a point of view there? I'm, I'm happy to take it. I think, um, you know, I think most of our customers are making longer-term commitments, uh, you know, 10-year commitments, 20-year commitments. You know, we're certainly making these 10, 20-year investments in energy and I think what we try to do and what our customers are trying to do are really to look beyond you know, any particular year or, you know, um, federal leadership and look into the future and see what they anticipate happening um, in decades uh, forward. And so I think that um, the loosening or relaxation of regulation under the current administration um, is not something that I think is going to create a lot of opportunity for us. And I don't know, you know, Rich, if you have a different point of view. I think I think we're really looking at, you know, um, what the commercial and industrial sector is doing and the kinds of um, commitments they're making as a real indicator of the future here, and also looking at the rest of the world, honestly, looking beyond the United States to see where where is the world going, and the world is definitely moving towards addressing, um, you know, climate change and trying to lower emissions. So that's what we take as more of an indicator than we would any particular, um, you know, presidential administration or any particular, you know, current action on regulations. Um, you know, Rich, do you do you disagree or? No, I think that's right on target. Okay, perfect. All right, so the next question is for Jonathan. Do you um, how do you integrate with existing systems uh, with Predix? Is there a software agent that's installed? No, actually, Predix Predix is a very 
workable platform. And, you know, in fact, actually going back to the last question about, you know, the application of it and the use of it, um, like I said during the presentation, we have 20,000 people working on the platform and developing applications. They're not just GE people, they're customer people and they're, they're other users of the system. So it's very open source. It's, it's, it's very easy to use and, and, you know, once you've, you've gone through some initial training on, on how to build applications on there, you can, you can literally just about build an application to do almost anything. And so it, it's, it's very easy, very open source. And so the integration of it becomes that much easier. You know, it's built on things like Amazon Web Service, which are a widely used service. You know, a lot of people program on there. And, and it's, it's, like I said, it's a very simple integration process um, to use it and get it up and running and, and be able to customize it and tailor it and build your own applications for whatever you might want to monitor. Okay, wonderful. Um, here's another question um, for Pop, perhaps Rich and, and for Amy. Um, just wanting to understand how we're balancing, you know, the growth of shale gas and that prospect of how it might impact um, the renewable energy um, prospect as well. Do, do you have a correlation there between availability of fuel sources like shale gas and renewable energy? Um, well, I'll take a I'll take a crack at it first. I think you know the issue is really that those different technologies um, are cited very differently. You know, so you you know it, the availability of um, natural gas um, and the and the cost effectiveness of it makes it attractive solution, but only in certain areas where there is um, where there is a need for it maybe to replace a more um, uh, emission heavy solution, but also where it can be cited. So, you know, that's, that becomes a, a real limiting factor. And then the same thing with renewables, you know, the renewable growth is really led by where we can cite renewable projects, where we can acquire land, where there's good assets for wind and solar, and then where there's demand, where there's demand for that. So I don't necessarily, I mean, certainly the, um, the the any the the nat, natural gas does fluctuate you know it has a fuel cost and it fluctuates um alongside the cost of oil and so it's a it's a commodity that is variable and you know the benefit that renewables has is there is no fuel cost so that's a little bit more predictable from a cost standpoint when looking into the future so i think if that's helpful at all i mean we we just really look at it it is a very complicated decision to figure out what to build where but it, there's a lot of siting concerns there's a lot of economic drivers you know sort of like where there's a demand and what what this new generation might be replacing you know as you um i think as we talked about earlier there's relatively flat load growth right now so that's really the biggest you're really looking at replacement generation for the most part uh, because we are not consuming more and more energy efficiency has made a lot of great uh, strides and so it has re you know flattened uh, load growth so so it becomes more of a replacement game and um, and then you have to replace with what is sort of um, you know best suited for that particular location. Rich, would you have anything else you want to add? No, we're just focused on operating as efficiently as possible uh, in all in all price environments and I think um, emphasizing and enhancing our ability to be uh, available, reliable, and efficient. Is, is important in every every gas price environment that we, that we could face. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think we have time for just one more question, and the question is, uh, Jonathan. Uh, I think you'd be the best one to uh, to respond to this one. Uh, you mentioned that the, there's a digital twin, and the question is. Is that a unique twin that is designed for each site, or are you able to reuse twins again and again? The answer is yes, <laughs> and, I, and I say that because <laughs> we we do use twins from other sites as a basis, uh, so we don't necessarily start from scratch with every twin, um, but when it's completed, it's a unique twin to the asset that we're looking to model. So, it, it, for example, if there's a, a two-on-one 7FA combined cycle plant in a particular market in a region, we, we have the ability to take that as a starting point 
and build on that and change things to make it unique to the twin that were to the asset that we're actually trying to model. So again, I said the answer is yes, we do both. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate all of you for taking the time today for answering these great questions that have come in. Um, any questions that we didn't get to, we'll, we'll try to respond to you um, in the next few minutes or via email after the webinar. Um, I just want to also remind everybody that the webinar will be available on demand and you'll receive a link within the next couple of days that will give you access to that archive and we would definitely encourage you to share it with your colleagues. Um, there's also content available in the resources list tab that Jonathan mentioned that are there for download, the white papers and, uh, and access to the um, operational flexibility tour. Um, we would also love for you to look back at the Electricity Value Network webcast series and see if there are any webcasts that you missed. Uh, and with that, I just want to thank Amy and Rich and Jonathan again for uh, sharing their uh, expertise in this space and hope everybody has a fantastic day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.